Hi, I'm Moshe Zeldman. Welcome to Schmoozing. We live in times of unprecedented change and confusion. The rise of cancel culture, the promises and the threats of artificial intelligence, identity politics. We live in a society where people are more digitally connected but are feeling lonelier than ever. And we're in a world that seems to be edging towards World War III. I believe that Judaism can shed light on all these issues. Schmoozing is more than a podcast. It's a community of thoughtful voices on today's important topics. I invite you to explore with me how Judaism can help us deepen our understanding of the times we live in, confront the challenges we face, and bring some light into this world. We are on part four of our series on how to think about stuff. Why are you spending so much time on this question of how to think about stuff? Because we always want to try as best as we can to live in reality. We want to be in touch with reality, and we find ourselves making mistakes. We don't always read situations properly. We regret who we voted for. We didn't read our boss properly. We missed something going on with our kids or our partner or our finances or the economy, the stock market. Um, You trusted the guy trying to sell you stuff, and that was a mistake, maybe. Or that fancy, shiny thing you bought, you realize later it was a scam. We find ourselves often being surprised and looking back and saying, how did I not get that? How did I not see that? And sometimes the answer is, there's just no way to know. Sometimes the answer is, we get in our own way of seeing reality for what it is. And we've really broken that down. Like that's what skews our vision. We've broken it down so far into three areas. Today, we're adding area number four. The first one we said was social conditioning. We make all kinds of assumptions about what's true, what's false, what's valuable, what's moral or immoral, what's cool, what's urgent, what's holy, what's irrelevant. And we do it based on how we were raised. You watch the daily news of Islamic terrorists going around the world, screaming Allahu Akbar and terrorizing people and killing and beheading people. And they really are convinced that they're doing some big holy act. Why? Simply because that's how they were raised. Second area is emotional bias. We convince ourselves to buy that thing because we're convinced that we need it. Six months later, we look back at it and realize it was all about our image or our ego or some inner desire we had that had nothing to do with the product. As another example, when we succeed at something, we like to take credit. When we fail, it's so much easier to blame others or to blame the circumstances, because we don't want to take responsibility for things that go wrong. We have a bias and an ego that wants to be protected in not seeing reality for what it is. Sometimes the reality is you just blew it. It's what's called the sunk cost fallacy, very common in psychology and in marketing, that people will continue to invest in something even when it doesn't make sense anymore simply because they've already invested so much. So there's this bad feeling of if I pull out now, that means I lost, even though I know that if I keep investing, I'm only going to lose more. But that's called an emotional bias. The third, we said, is social pressure. We've all done things that we knew were stupid. And we did them simply because we cared more about being accepted, about being cool, about being part of the gang, whether it's smoking or drinking or drugs or doing something stupid and risky. We did it because we wanted to be accepted more than us wanting to do what we knew was really good for us. Look at those pictures of you as a teenager with that crazy haircut you had. And because at the time, you felt like that was a life and death situation. Your parents thought you were nuts. You insisted, I have to get that piercing or that tattoo or that haircut. Why? Social pressure. So in all three of these areas, social conditioning, emotional bias, or social pressure, the Torah's main insight that we got was be aware. Be aware of what's going on when you're making decisions. When we read about the laws of judges and their need to be impartial, we think, obviously, of course, but nobody had those kinds of psychological sensitivities 3,000 years ago. We were living in a world that glorified child sacrifice where only the elite 2% had any kind of education, where the pinnacle of society was being a warrior in the battle. At that same time, Jews were working on visiting the sick, helping the poor, educating our kids to be more emotionally sensitive. 
it's a given that when we teach our kids about Abraham questioning the values he was raised with, or we teach about the lengths that judges have to go to to remain impartial, we're teaching our children to apply these ideas to their lives. The point of learning Torah is never to just philosophize. We don't look at Torah as a history book or as a story book. Achmanides, a 13th century scholar, says that for every time you sit down to learn Torah, before you get up, when you finish, ask yourself, what's the takeaway? Why did God want me to know about this story about Noah and the flood or the Tower of Babel or about Cain killing Abel? Why do I have to know that Moses had a speech impediment when he went to Pharaoh to try and get the Jews out? Every message of Torah is a message that's there for us in our own personal growth. That being said, let's now look at another way we miss the boat in how we apprehend reality. I'll start with the story. Dan Ariely, actually an Israeli, who's a behavioral economist at MIT, wrote a best-selling book called Predictably Irrational. Here's what he did. He set up a coffee shop in the business school offering coffee to MBA students, right? And these are MBA students. They should know a lot about branding. And here's how he said it. He said, we handed our participants their cups of coffee and then pointed them to a table set with coffee additives, milk, cream, half a nap, white sugar, brown sugar. We also set out some unusual condiments, cloves, nutmeg, orange peel, anise, sweet paprika, and cardamom for our coffee drinkers to add to their cups as they pleased. The first time he ran the experiment, he had fancy dishes like you might find in a really upscale coffee shop. He says, sometimes we place them in beautiful glass and metal containers, set on a brushed metal tray with small silver spoons and nicely printed labels. At other times, we placed the same odd condiments in white styrofoam cups. The labels were handwritten in a red felt tip pen. We went further and not only cut the styrofoam cups shorter, but even gave them jagged hand cut edges. Once the coffee was poured, sipped and enjoyed, these MBA students were asked to rate the coffee first on quality, then put a price at what they'd pay for it even though they were drinking the exact same coffee with the exact same mix-ins. What did they find? Well, people who drank from fancy cups loved the coffee. They offered to pay a high price for it. People who drank out of the torn styrofoam cups didn't love it as much, didn't want to pay as much for it, and didn't use any of the added, even though the coffee and mix-ins were exactly the same in both scenarios. The lesson? We judge books or coffees by their covers. Anybody who's in the world of sales knows that it's all about how you present your brand. The rule in marketing is a brand is the sum total of all interactions a customer has with you. And when a first impression, like a glance at the product packaging is good, your customer will have a better opinion of it and more likely buy it. So the reality is we do judge books and stores and cars and fancy looking organic something or another kind of juice and people by their covers. In the 31 presidential elections between 1900 and 2020, 21 of the winning candidates have been taller than their opponents and nine have been shorter. In elections where one president is taller than the other, the taller president is overwhelmingly more likely to win. We know having whiter teeth makes you more likable. Driving a fancy new car makes people think you're more special. In psychology, this is called the framing effect. The framing effect is that people make different decisions based on how information is presented rather than the information itself. Just like how the coffee looks rather than the actual taste of the coffee. We've all seen the ads on videos, TikTok videos, YouTube videos, the ad of some dude in a lab coat saying, scientific studies show that these diet pills, and even if you know that anybody can put on a lab coat, Anybody can say scientific studies show because you're not really saying anything that has any factual basis. But we all know if that same dude made the same pitch in shorts and a t-shirt, you just wouldn't take it seriously. So we're very familiar with the idea that it's easy to fall into surface impressions and not get to the core of what something really is. What's the Torah's approach to this? Obviously, don't fall for it. In the writings of the rabbis in Pirkei Avot, the Ethics of the Fathers, their statement is, Al tistakel bakankan, ele bemashe yeshbo. Don't look at the container, look at what's inside it. 
I actually tried, I actually had this experiment myself. I was one time last year shopping at Ikea. And as you check out of Ikea, at the end, there's a little grocery store. They have all kinds of products there that Ikea makes or labels. And they had wine, Ikea wine. And I was really curious what Ikea wine tastes like. So it was interesting because the bottle didn't say anywhere on it, Ikea. It was produced for Ikea, but it had another, you know, pretty decent looking label on it. I bought a bottle. It cost $5. I came home. I had it. I served it to my guests at Shabbat. And everyone thought it was a pretty decent wine. So then I took it to the next step. The next time I was at Ikea, I bought a box of it, 12 bottles of the same wine. So it was $60 of wine. And as I would have guests for Shabbat and they would come to my table, I would put this nice looking bottle of wine on the table and I would say, this wine is $60. Tell me what you think. And people would drink it and say, wow, it's a nice wine, has a nice aroma, has a nice bouquet, et cetera, et cetera. And then I said, by the way, when I said $60, it's not $60 for the bottle. It was $60 for 12 bottles. People were consistently shocked. It's all about packaging. The Torah actually gives an interesting example of this. God came to Samuel the prophet and told him, it's time to pick a new king. Go to this certain family, the family of Yishai, the family of Jesse. You will find that one of his sons is going to be the perfect man to be the king of the Jewish people. Samuel shows up at the house. He saw the eldest son. His name was Eliav. He thought for sure Eliav is the one that God wants to pick. He looked great. He was tall. He had charisma. He had stature. He had gravitas. God said, no, that's not the guy. Went to another one. No, that's not the guy. That's not the guy. You know who it is? It's David. David's the youngest kid. He is the scrappiest looking. He doesn't even want to be there. He's the last person that from appearance, you would assume is supposed to be the king. When Samuel first thought it was the elder good looking brother, God says to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. God does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance. God looks at the heart. God is saying, don't judge a book by its cover. And there is a rabbi, Mordechai Liner, who makes a really interesting comment where the Torah says the word Shema. We're familiar with the phrase Shema Yisrael, hear, O Israel. He says there's a fundamental difference between seeing and hearing, and what each one communicates. When we see something, we understand the surface of it, the externality of it. When we hear something, we understand the of it. You can look at a wall and it looks like a solid wall. When you knock it, when you hear the sound, then you know, is this drywall? Is this brick? Is it wood? Is it thick? Is it thin? One of the great 20th century scholars of technology of communication is Walter Ong. He talks about the unique relationship of sound to interiority when sound is compared to the rest of the senses. He says, this relationship is important because of the interiority of human consciousness and of human communication itself. In other words, it's because of sound, especially speaking and listening, that we are really present to one another as subject rather than object. When we listen, when we catch nuances, when we catch tone, we encounter a whole different dimension of reality. When we're listening, we're personally engaged far more than when we just watch something. Walter Ong talks about this as being one of the special features of the Torah, that God creates the world through speech. And the Lord said, let there be light. He reveals himself to the Jewish people in words. He made a covenant with the Jewish people with words. As a matter of fact, the Hebrew word for word, davar, also means a thing, an event, a happening, an actual thing, because speech creates reality. I saw a great line from Rabbi Jonathan Sachs. He says, if the greatest thing God does is speak, then the greatest thing we can do is listen. There's the famous story of Elijah the prophet who escaped those who were trying to kill him and he was trying to seek out God. He escaped to Mount Horeb and he was hiding there. After 40 days of waiting, he stood at the mountain and he got this very strange vision. He saw a whirlwind, then an earthquake, then a huge fire, but he could not find God in any of these things. Then when all those things were gone, God spoke to him, the Bible says, in a still, small voice. A still, small voice you can only hear if you're really listening. 
because we believe in a God who's invisible, and we're not even allowed to make images that represent him like a sun or a moon, we believe that the world has an inner essence that's hidden. Idol worship is based on what you see is what you get. God of the earth, God of the sun, God of the sea, God of the lightning. God is not nature. God transcends nature. You have to listen very carefully and go beyond surface impressions if you want to find God. This also all touches on a field called heuristics. Heuristics is essentially the way your brain finds shortcuts to reach conclusions without having to go through all the process of step-by-step -step linear thinking. Our brains are always wired to save energy and look for shortcuts. One of the ways we do it is we stereotype. We oversimplify our beliefs about social groups as a basis for how we're going to respond to them. And based on that, we make decisions about individuals. So we might say Asians are good at math. We might say Republicans are rich. We might say people from Florida are elderly. We make assumptions like this all the time because there is some truth to it sometimes in some of those examples, but we like to stereotype because it makes it easier and that way we don't have to think so much. That might also explain the idea of modesty. There are laws in Torah about niyut, modesty, and it's about people not dressing in a way that attract others to their physical features. So maybe in Judaism, the fact that a woman can't walk around publicly with a miniskirt and her cleavage showing is her way of saying, I'm more than just the body. Engage with me based on who I am, not what I look like. And by the way, this is clearly meant for men. Men have much more of a tendency to judge women based on appearances than women do to men. Most studies have shown that in terms of attraction to the opposite sex, men care more about looks, women care more about intelligence. On the other hand, women are more attracted to men that come from affluent zip codes. Men don't care about that as much. And this could also explain the idea of modesty for men. The more you move towards traditional Jewish communities, the more you find that fashion and fashion icons are just not a thing. In the ultra-Orthodox world, everyone dresses exactly the same. They're all wearing black and white with the same hat, the same kind of shirt, the same kind of shoes. It forces you, if you're in that community, to have to develop an identity totally based on who you are internally, not who you present yourself to be externally. And I think it makes a lot of sense. Would a woman rather marry a man who's responsible, emotionally healthy, and will make a great father, even if he struggles with money? Or would she rather marry a man who's wealthy, but abusive, insecure, and, and a spoiled brat? Wouldn't it be easier to shop if you knew how to see past the fluff, the window dressing, and know the actual value of what it is you're buying? Problem is that image wins the day, and the good guy or the good girl or the truly good car that just didn't have a good marketing plan behind it never makes it onto our radar screen because we don't take enough time to scratch beneath the surface. As another interesting example, the Hebrew word for clothing is beged. And beged is the same word as the word bagad. Bagad means to betray. We say on Yom Kippur, ashamnu bagadnu. Bagadnu doesn't mean we got dressed. Bagadnu means we have betrayed. Clothing can be used to betray. When Jacob wanted to steal the blessings away from his brother Esau, he went to his blind father Isaac, dressed in the clothes of Esau, and said, it's me, your son Esau. And the clothing fooled him, and the clothing fooled his father, and he got the blessing. When the brothers got rid of Joseph by throwing him into a pit. They took his clothes, dipped it in blood, brought it to their father, Jacob, ironically, who had already fooled his father years earlier, brought him this coat and said, look what happened. And his father says, oh my gosh, my son must be dead. Clothing, superficial appearances, can definitely be used in a negative way. But there's much more to this story. When we look at how the Torah describes the building of the temple, the sanctuary, the high priest in his robes, in his garments. The temple itself was this unbelievable, glorious edifice. It was grandiose, gold, silver, marble. It was beautiful. The Kohanim, the priests had to be good-looking people. The high priest had to get a haircut every week. He had to wear beautiful clothes decorated with all kinds of gems. The king needed to get a haircut every day. When the Torah talks about these ideas, about outer beauty, 
the Torah says that these are there, likavod ulitiferet. They are there for glory and for splendor. They will make an impression on you. The Torah is acknowledging, yes, you should look beyond the surface. Yes, you should see the inner essence of something. Don't get taken for a ride by something superficial. But at the same time, we have to acknowledge the reality. We are affected by the superficial. You walk into a grandiose building, you feel different. The reality is that the outer does affect the inner. When you're dressed up nicely to go to a formal party, it feels weird to go through a drive through and get a pack of fries. It doesn't feel right. If the president gave his State of Union address from the Oval Office in his tennis shorts, it would be hard to take him seriously. So the Torah is essentially saying you shouldn't fall for appearances. You should try not to fall for appearances, but you will. We will judge superficially. And you should know that other people will also judge you by your appearances. So if you want to be taken seriously, you have to understand the mentality and sometimes the superficiality of how other people are going to look at you. All of this is very confusing from a Jewish perspective because truth has a very high value in Judaism. An emes dika Jew means somebody who's honest, honest through and through. When the Torah talks about the prohibition of lying, it doesn't say thou shalt not lie. It says distance yourself from falsehood. Don't just stay away from it. Stay far away from it. So we shouldn't just avoid telling lies. We should not do anything that even implies something that's false. With that being said, let's look a little more carefully at this story we mentioned earlier. We have our forefather, Isaac, who in his old age is blind. He decides that he has to pass on the baton of the Jewish people and the destiny of the Jewish people to his children. He has a son, Esav, and a son, Jacob. Esav, we know, was a bit of a wild character. He was a hunter. He had a whole collection of women that would follow him around. And the Torah even describes Esav as a man who was crafty with his words. He knew how to fool Isaac. He was very good at making impressions and creating false realities. Jacob is described as a person who just sat in his tent. He dwells in tents. He's quiet. Burns all day. He might even be described as a little naive. And then when Rebecca overhears that her husband Isaac is planning on giving the blessing to Asav, she realizes that that would be tragic. Asav's going to totally squander this blessing. He's going to use it to conquer the world in all kinds of negative ways. Jacob needs to get the blessing. So Rebecca calls in her son Jacob. Says, Jacob, listen, your father's about to make a terrible mistake. We can avert it. I want you to dress up wearing your brother Asaph's clothing. Asaph was a really hairy guy. Jacob was not. So Jacob put skins on his arms and his shoulders that had fur on them so that when he comes into the tent and Isaac, who's blind, tries to feel him, he'll feel and assume that it's his son Asaph. Jacob says, are you sure? I don't want to lie. Rebecca says, this one's on me. It's got to be done. So she prepares the food. As Asaph is out trying to find some food, so Jacob the innocent, naive one now has to, for the first time in his life, do something false. He has to dress up like Esau. And it's hard. When we're kids growing up in the safety of our homes and our families, we can say whatever we think. We can dress however we want. We can do whatever we want because our parents love us unconditionally. But as we start to get a little older, our parents tell us, you have to be polite. You have to say please. You have to say thank you. You have to clean up after yourself. Because we live in a world where people need to see a certain decorum. So we can't just do what we want or eat how we want or dress how we want or say what we want. Asaph knew how to play the game. Jacob had to learn that in the real world, forget the world of theory and books and academics and philosophy, in the real world, where people will judge you based on first appearances, you have to learn how to play that game. When you live in a world of scammers, you can't be naive or you're going to get scammed too. The danger in all of this is that if we take the game to the extreme, we lose touch with ourselves. We become the persona that we want people to think of us. Instead of trying to become the best people we can be, we want people to see us as the best people we can be. So when we're out there in the world trying to win friends and influence people and land deals, we also have to remember to not do it in a way where we totally lose touch with who we are. There has to be a balance between who I am on the outside 
which I have to pay attention to, and who I am on the inside, who's the real me. When I'm able to be vulnerable and take down that public persona and talk about my fears, my insecurities, my struggles, no relationship can survive when it's a persona encountering a persona. People have to know when to put on the persona, cut it out in the public arena, and when to let go of the public persona when they have to be themselves and be involved in a genuine relationship. And even in close relationships, there's a value to diplomacy. You don't tell your wife the dress looks ugly. You tell your wife that other dress you wore looked even better on you. And in the Torah itself, even God has a moment where he bends the truth for the sake of diplomacy. Abraham and Sarah were older. And the angels came to them and told them they were going to have a child. And when the angels came to Sarah and told her she was going to have a child, she laughed. And she said, me and my old husband are going to have kids? Ha! Huh, that's crazy. And she was kind of saying something disparaging about Abraham. When God revealed himself to Abraham and told him what happened, he said, Sarah laughed. He didn't say Sarah laughed at you. He said Sarah laughed. He hid some of the truth. His goal was not to fool Abraham. His goal was to make sure that the harmony between Abraham and Sarah stays intact, even if Sarah had a moment of saying something that wasn't nice. So ultimately, when it comes to how we look at others, our job is to really see past the surface, really listen, look for nuance, don't jump to stereotypes, and really see the person as an individual for who they are. And to see past the glit, the marketing, the window dressing, not to be emotionally persuaded by the fancy packaging, to really ask realistic questions about the value of the thing you're buying. When it comes to how we present ourselves, the tightrope walk we have to walk is that on the one hand, to the outside world, we have to have a persona. We have to know that how you dress, how you talk, how well your hair is brushed, what style of glasses you're wearing makes a difference. It makes an impression on people. It's the reality of how the world works. And if you don't go with that trend, you will lose. At the same time, we have to be able to be raw and real and genuine and vulnerable to ourselves and to people that are close to us. You can be raw and real and genuine and still be diplomatic, but the goal is to be raw and real and vulnerable and genuine. Thank you for listening. Please like, subscribe, and also leave feedback if you liked the content, and especially if you didn't. These are important conversations, so let's keep schmoozing.